Welcome to the NABS podcast. NABS is the support organisation for those working in advertising, marketing and media. I'm your host, Louise Scody. Each week I'll be chatting with someone from our industry to find out how they support themselves and those around them through challenging times as well as the day to day. And it's all to help you support your own mental wellness. I can't wait to start chatting. This week our guest is Trevor Robinson OBE. Trevor is CEO and partner at Quiet Storm Advertising. He's one of the most high profile and highly regarded people in the industry, despite being told by his school careers advisor that he'd have more chance of being a bus driver. Trevor is responsible for some of the UK's most famous ad campaigns, including the 90s You've Been Tangoed. In 1995, Trevor set up Quiet Storm, the first agency to write, direct and produce its own work. Trevor runs Quiet Storm together with his wife, Branya, who has also been a guest on the NAPS podcast. Together with Rania, Trevor also runs Create Not Hate, an initiative that helps underrepresented young people into creative careers. Trevor is recognised in many influencer lists, and in 2009, he was awarded an OBE for his services to charity and advertising. Welcome, Trevor. It's really good to have you on the NABS podcast. How are you doing? I'm very well, actually. I'm just pleased that there's still sunshine um, at this late August period in terms of I'm not looking forward to the winter so as long as the sun and sun shine through the window I'm, I'm happy. Well I'm going to ask you what mental wellness looks like to you and <laughs> and does it look like having sunny weather to help you along or have you got other resources you can draw when it does get gloomy and wintry? I, th- I think especially in our business it can, can be quite stressful because it's like if you're in a small business you're forever pleasing the clients that are on the table, but also trying to bring new clients in and trying to keep the old ones. So it's a never ending sort of like merry-go-round of, of, of stress at times. But the thing that makes me, and which I've always been fortunate as an occupation, is I love being involved with a creative process, whether it's um, coming up with ideas or nurturing ideas or instilling, you know, seeing people who don't think they're creative become creative and, and see the rewards that comes with that take take fruition. So that's really, you know, one of the things that keeps me buzzing. And the other thing is just, you know, um, being around youngsters from my own kids to the people that I work with, uh, feeling their ideas and feeling their, their kind of joys and excitement about the future, which is always, it can be, you can easily get kind of pessimistic and wallow in the past and, you know, even in the good past. And in terms of how you view in the future. So if you were having an off day where you felt like your mental wellness wasn't tip top, what would you do? Would you reach out to someone younger in your team or one of your kids maybe for a chat to uplift you? Uh, not really. Um, I Probably the, the key things for me is to go for a walk, jump on my bike, go down the gym um, or watch a, watch an old movie or a movie that, that, you know, interests me or things. I'm a great one for being inspired by by stuff that I see. So going to an exhibition or, you know, anything creative that I find really helps me. I'm not terribly good at chats and stuff, unless it's with my family or my friends um, that I kind of, I feel like I'm able to um, get some reward from that. I'm not very good at it, finding it elsewhere. You're responsible for one of the most memorable ads of all time. You know you've been tangoed, which people still say that catchphrase, and that was back in 92 when it was on TV. Um, It's been named in a Channel 4 and Sunday Times poll as the third best ad ever. What I'm interested in is the link here between mental wellness and values, because your work is famously values-led, and where mental wellness and values enable you to produce really fresh work like that, the sense of originality so do you remember where you were with your mental wellness when you made that ad and where you were values wise as well it's quite interesting because um well it may may or may not be interesting but me and Al my great partner Al Young we were on Dole for quite a few years trying to get into advertising feeling that this is an uphill struggle and we'll never break in and when we did break in we got fried again after a year um let go as they say and then and um it was quite desperate. So when we got a job at Hal Henry, Child Court Lurie, we still felt that the door was going to come off the hinges and people just like, right, you're on your bike. Um, 
you know, you're not, you're not wanted here. So we knew we had to do something that the outside world would recognize and like and see and talk about. And we, cause we knew it wasn't enough for just the industry to know us, know us. We wanted to try and create talkability out there. So when we got the client, when we had the opportunity to work on BrickFit and a client walked in the door and said to not just me and Al, but to the creative department, I want to be famous. I want to do famous work. I want, I want Coca-Cola to be scared of us and notice this little British company is doing something new. And, um, and that was music to our ears because that meant that me and Al could just say, right, gloves are off. Let's do something that's going to get talked about. And it was a reactionary idea as well. It was, it was kind of really, you don't notice it, but it's taken the mickey out of cause and effect advertising where you, you have a, a pleasant drink or eat a product or something and lovely things happen to you. And we, we laughed about what if horrible things happen to you when you have this drink, so, but shrouded with a comedic, funny characters. How did you feel about the reaction to the ad? Uh, the reaction to the ad was exactly what we wanted in terms of people was talking about it. And like you say, people still remember it now. It was a bit disturbing that people were running up and down and smacking, Peter, smacking each other and stuff like that. That was not in t- the intention at all. It didn't even cross my mind that people would do that because it was just one of, of the executions we did, with the orange man slap. And it was also meant to be in this little mystical odd world. Um, so it, it did, I didn't see how that was going to affect people talking, um, people physically doing it. And it was actually um, a couple of doctors who got perforated eardrums by smacking other student doctors in the ear. Um, that was the ones that um, got it banned. So I thought it was quite ironic, these young doctors um, causing it to be, to be banned in the first place. Yes, they're sometimes the most experimental people, aren't they, when it comes to testing the limits of the human body? Yes, I, I, I know a few doctors and stuff. I can definitely agree with that. Possibly not congruent with mental wellness, so we wouldn't recommend it. No. Um, now, you run Quiet Storm together with your wife, Rania. She's also been on the podcast. So this makes you a well-known Adland power couple. Um, now, I'll ask you the same questions that I'm going to ask you now. So this is like playing Mr. and Mrs. basically. What's it like, no pressure, what's it like for you working and living together? How do you support your mental wellness and hers so that you can protect any boundaries you want in place as well as your relationship? Um, I think we're lucky because um, I really do need somebody that gets what I do and I can trust that I work that I work with. They've, they've got my back, as it were. And, you know, but, you know, what comes with it is obviously a lot of pressure because when you win something, it's great. When you're doing good work and people are patting you on the, the back, it's great because it's, you're sharing it together. But when things are going bad, it's like you look at each other for the problems and you look at yourself and there's no escaping it. If you, you work with someone, you go home, that person's there. And that person, even when they're not doing anything, is is a reminder of, of what um, failure is and what, and what hardship is when when you go through recessions and lockdowns and and I found especially when because of COVID, <clears throat> it really allowed me to kind of really gauge how we work together because we were definitely locked in. And that one stage we was using the same computer, which was madness. And um and before I used to sort of like say, right, as soon as we get past our garden fence door, we don't talk about work and run yet. We'll, we'll passionately talk about work and follow me around the house from the, the bathroom to the, to the kitchen. And I'm like, and I need to escape. That's hence I go for walks and I, you know, and, and I, I do like to go out at night with, with my mates just to forget about what we do for a living at times. But I think we've got it really locked down that um, we kind of know when we're both needing a bit of space, when we both need a bit of a shoulder to, lean on we, we so i think we've been working together for almost 16 years so it's something that we we kind of learn how to really coexist and and, and help each other do you have a rule when you go out let's not talk about work yeah, I definitely have a role. I, I think we automatically do it a bit more, but sometimes Rani would say, or, or I say, right, 
tonight I want us to discuss this before we meet up with everybody else. And that really clears the air, you know, especially when there's things that um, I'm not, I can feel some tension, but I don't know what it is. And then and as soon as you can get these things out in the open, you just have to be, I think, just wary and clever of each other in terms of what's worrying you and, and, and hearing things out. And sometimes I have to, um, have input on those things in a working sense, and it could. So you're trying to divide away from personal and from and from um, actually, you know, the the strengths and weaknesses of people that you're working around. And sometimes it can get blurred because if you don't like a person, it does not necessarily mean they're not great at their job. It's a double whammy of communication needs, isn't it? Because you've got mm. to communicate clearly with the work relationship and you have to communicate clearly within your personal relationship for both of those to function. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's sometimes because it, it, it can seep into that. You just kind of sometimes I find myself like, whoa, we're getting heated. Like it's a, a argument about, you know, home life or finances or something. We're, we're, all of those things I dislike arguing about anyway. I'd, I'd rather have a discussion but some obviously sometimes it becomes a heated discussion and sometimes it gets personal and you kind of think especially when it's work mm. I really don't think there's any room for it to get personal what you and Ronya also have in common is that you're both known for driving forward diversity in our industry especially with create not hate which you co-founded um, and that aims to bring young underrepresented people into Adland. Now, from your own experience as a young black man trying to make it in the industry, what were the challenges that you faced? Do you think those challenges are still around today or can you see anything else facing rising black talent? I do, I do see a big difference, a marked difference. Like everybody from um, Jeremy Green, who runs Creative Circle, and him, a real campaigner to get diversity into the industry and fueled into the industry. Um, I, I see a lot more female and black in, in the industry, which is, I think is a big change from, which I didn't realize it was so toxic at the time of male, lots of men around being all geezerish and, you know, wrestling in reception areas, great department. Um, I, I used to find that, okay, you just thought, well, this is what it is, but now I can feel the difference and it just feels a lot less crazy and a lot more, more of a, a a, a, a natural order of the things you know it it's always seems a bit weird when it was just like all white all middle class or, or some working class but they they definitely weren't like the working class that I'd met um it felt a lot more privileged and a lot less like the outside world who we, who who we was meant to be trying to communicate to which I must admit I always thought I had you know an ace an ace card up my sleeve because I was thinking, I'm I'm selling to the people that I grow up, grew up with, and I kind of feel I'm, I'm closer to knowing how to communicate, how to entertain, and how to let these people buy into the personality of these brands. And um, I do think that 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 line has uh, has definitely started to to diminish a bit, but it's still there, and it's still I'm still really aware of through creating not hate. There's a lot of people out there talented people out there that won't know won't even think about getting into the advertising industry it's just not definitely not as glamorous as it used to be when I was growing up I used to always feel that I used to see ads when I was a kid and go oh I wish I could do something like that that people at like at my school was excitedly talked about sometimes the ideas were stronger than the, the tv programs we were watching and um I I, I just want to plant that seed into those guys out there and also love the industry not just for lip service but for them to really understand there's a lot of talent out there that can help your business and help your clients do more extraordinary and uh, you know uh, and breathtaking work that will get people talking about your brand so I I, I feel as that that's the dual coin of, of what I'd like to be involved with. What do you think is the major challenge here? There's one thing that we identified in our research, diversity and focus, uh, which we did a few years ago, um, and the lack of role models within the industry was highlighted as something that people find really difficult. So they may be from a black or an Asian background, for example, and they'll be the only person in an all-white company. And because they can't see someone like themselves who's progressed up the ladder, 
they don't feel welcome necessarily or they don't feel like it's a place they can progress and really grow their career. And it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I, obviously I come from years ago before, uh, you know, most people listen to this. <laughs> it's like I come from an era where you, you, you're you just happy to go in and do a job and you're happy to get a job that, you know, that you could have a certain lifestyle and you, your work can be seen on a poster or, and, or in a, um, on TV. So for me, it was just like, I was just happy to be sat at the table. Uh, I think now there's a lot more, I was, you know, I'm a lot more aware that people want to feel, feel that this is a lovely place to work at. And this is a, um, as well as it being a great opportunity. Do you know what I mean? So mm. I can see, I can see the, the younger generation like going, you know, I, d- I don't like, these guys don't seem to like me and I don't like them and I'm not going to go to their office parties or hang out for a bit. And, um, and I kind of, I've, I've always been of, of a mind as long as I can do a job that makes me happy and I, and I get some kind of financial and mental reward from it, that's really it for me. But I can see as in, you know, even with my company, I, I could see um, like we, we deliberately have once a week, we have an opportunity to have a little drink with each other in the office before everybody goes home so people can just become a little bit more human. And because and, I can see the necessity in that, but the, I, I'd, I'd never, I can't pretend I know how to cope with a company if they don't have as many people, like minded for many people that of, of, of color in the company so that they can look for a role model in that. I, I don't know how to deal with that because I've, I've not worked for anybody else for over 30 years. So I can only see, I'm in a bit of a bubble when it comes to what's, what's it like for people. Um, in other agencies what do you think would be one piece of advice you'd give to other agencies maybe who are having a problem attracting talent from diverse backgrounds well it's i would say get get some people at a higher level working within your company that aren't from oxford and cambridge and and are you know go out your way get out your comfort zone go out and go to those schools and colleges and universities and seek them out because it's important um, if you're gonna if you're gonna change it, you've got to change it at the top. You can't expect young people to just come in like because you can see people get are intimidated by the young and are intimidated by you know. Um, I was thinking that when I was doing create not hate, and I got some really lovely, talented creative directors in from the industry. Vicky McGuire, Dave Dyer, they all came in, and quite a few old, old mates came in. But I could physically see them. Not not those two particularly, but I could. See, I, I know because one of them actually told me he was quite intimidated to to be in a room full of young black kids and and just didn't feel at first he had the equipment that, uh, to be able to communicate to them. So his response, or most of the response, was like, "God, I can't wait till this is over." But by the end of the uh, the day, I think it was on both sides. The kids were like able to. To go, hang on, this guy is actually quite nice and he's quite intelligent, or she's quite, she's got, she's got so insane, she cares, and vice versa. The, get, the guys were like looking at these kids and going, wow, that was some really great ideas in just one day or even half of a day after we uh, ended rambling at them. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, um, I, I, yeah, I, I could only say people need to hire and get and see the importance of getting people of colour at senior level. But also, everybody within the company needs to take a front foot in getting outside their comfort zone and talking to people, talking and wanting to wanting to communicate with people and sit down with them and, and, and kind of gauge who they are, because that makes a stronger team all around. But people don't feel it's a part of their remit, about their job remit. I just do my bit and I'll go home. And so it's kind of like... It's important if you want to get the best out of people, you've got to make them feel comfortable. You've got to try your your best to make them feel like wanted. And I'm just not sure, you know, again, I have to put a big sort of like line and sort of like say, I don't know what it's like to work for somebody else because I haven't done it for a long time. So, but I would, that would be my advice to answer to your question. How does the Adland community lift you up? Um, the Adline community. I think, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not a massive uh, one for 
hanging out with ad people. Do you know what I mean? I see them at, at award dues and, and we're lucky enough to go to Cannes once a year. And um, when I'm not working, it's lovely to just catch up with people. And you do, I think that's really nice when you, you know, you can just generally just ask people if they're honest, it's actually re quite refreshing other than people coming to you, oh, we're doing really well. And like, <laughs> you know, if you can get past that, that Adlan crapology, you can, you, you, there's a lot you can get from each other. You, can, you get other war stories, you get, you know, even um, ideas of how to deal with clients, how to deal with getting more business. So that is really good. But in terms of lifting up, I'd say, I would go back to people like Jeremy Green, where, where he's so, they just seem so genuinely just trying to help and just trying to do good stuff and just and see the merit and excitement. They have a genuine visual, visual uh, excitement when, when you know they're with these youngsters. And, you know, so I guess that, that is really, that, that is quite rewarding and uplifting. Loving the idea of Adland crapology. <laughs> now <laughs> trying to get I mean, that I phrase mean, around my, my head. My usual waking up of words. Because <laughs> I, I don't know, I can't think of the words at the right time. So end up, <laughs> it sounds interesting. Listen, it, it painted a picture of what it is. So, so yeah. I think we can all adopt that phrase. Um, amazingly, we've got to the end of the chat. It's just one more question, which is, what's a lesson you've learned about how to support yourself? Um, I think the lessons to learn, it really, again, goes back to me and Al on the, the door and doors being slammed in the face and, you know, and feeling like you're just getting nowhere. And I remember we were really down, both me and Al, at times, and you get your dough check and it'd be gone in, like, two minutes. <laughs> and, then like, and then you're scrabbling and it sounds weird. But actually, it was some of the best times of my life when it was me and Al. And we had some of the most, you know, can't stop laughing kind of, and it bonded us. And I realized when I got a job in uh, in advertising that one of the best times I ever had was out of advertising trying to get in. And it was because it was quite, you know, uniform. It was, uh, you know, it was odd, but it was uh, like every victory, it was for both of us. And I think probably why I enjoy working with my wife is because it, it just, it, when, when things are going right and you're both going through things, it's, it's incredible, incredibly empowering and uplifting and, and rewarding. You know, you both can beam at each other and you both know what each other is, is happy about. And, and you know, you grow and you, you fail together. But yeah, I'd say, I'd just say kind of don't be afraid of things going wrong. That is a very pragmatic yet positive note on which to end. Trevor Robinson, you've been an absolute delight. All right. Thanks so much, Trevor. Take Appreciate care. It. Bye. Bye.